Hello, everybody. We'll just get started here. Welcome everybody in. My name is Patrick O'Malley, and uh, today we're going to be talking about how and why it's important to master lacerations as an emergency medicine resident. Uh, but while we're waiting for people to join and get let into the room, uh, you can see the chat over on the side. If you could let us know where you're from, uh, what program you're with, maybe even what year uh, you are in your training. It looks like people are coming in. All right, so we'll uh, we'll go ahead and get started. It's about 3.01. Again, my name is Patrick O'Malley. I'm the course director and founder of The Laceration Course. With me today behind the scenes, behind the camera, uh, is Valerie Uhouse with EB Medicine. And the talk today, well, that says June 27th. That's not correct. Today is uh, August the 8th. So sorry about that. Uh, but special thanks to the AAEM, RSA, and EB Medicine for hosting this talk. Um, my name is Patrick O'Malley. I'm an emergency physician. I trained in emergency medicine at Carolina's Medical Center in Charlotte um, and have been in practice for 16 years, working in the emergency department as well as the urgent care space for a little while. Um, I'm heavily involved in urgent care medicine on the board of directors for the College of Urgent Care Medicine and speak at urgent care conferences. And again, uh, the creator of the laceration course uh, with EB Medicine, who many of you are probably already familiar with uh, through their emergency medicine uh, journals, uh, emergency medicine practice and pediatric emergency medicine practice. So for me, this all began actually before I was in med school. I was a tech in the emergency department uh, in Charlotte and came back there for residency. And the first week of our intern year, uh, we had a five-day, very intensive suturing and laceration management workshop, which really, really stuck with me over the years. And when I decided to put this course together a couple of years ago, I went back and referenced uh, the lectures that were given to us by one of my favorite attendings and, and residency director, Dr. Parker Hayes. Uh, so I essentially just kind of uh, took it a, a few steps further and expanded on it to what we have today. Why this matters. Um, as a resident, you've got just an incredible learning opportunity. You aren't expected to manage you know, eight to 10 patients at one time, for the most part, most likely. Uh, you've got attending physician backup and oversight. Uh, you probably have consultants that you can work with and consult for more complex lacerations. But once you complete residency and are in the community setting, there's a good chance that that backup and that oversight is not going to be there. Uh, for myself, I work in a single coverage emergency department. We do have PA coverage uh, 12 hours a day but we don't have a plastic surgeon. And in a lot of places, plastic surgery is not even an option. Uh, we do have ear, nose and throat, um, who's able to help out with some facial uh, injuries on occasion. Uh, but for the most part, when you get out into the real world, uh, the buck stops with you and you are going to have to be able to manage these things. Um, also in terms of your reimbursement, whenever you get out into community practice is going to be largely uh, based on the documentation and the charting that you do. So I do talk a lot about that as well. Um, but the, the bottom line is that you do need to be able to manage these lacerations yourself and develop this skill set and the confidence now uh, while you have the ability to do so and before you hit the uh, the ground running uh, within the next couple of years. So during residency, you know, every every program is different and you may have didactics on lacerations. You may have some workshops. You may have some off-service rotations where you can get some additional experience, but you have to ask yourself when you finish, do you have this skill set so that you can practice independently and manage anything that walks through your door? So a little, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we sent a survey out to a lot of uh, EB Medicine's uh, student and resident subscribers. We, it was a small sample size, 
uh, and it does lend itself to possibly a future study if any of you are interested. Um, but what we found is that uh, nearly half of the programs don't provide any specific didactic training on managing lacerations. Um, most residents are performing six to 10 lacerations per month, and 72% uh, of those who were surveyed said that they only feel somewhat prepared to manage lacerations when they finish residency, and 10% said that they are not prepared at all. Um, only 3% said that they didn't need any additional education on this. So it, we're, we're definitely seeing a, a pretty significant knowledge and skill gap when it comes to this skill set. Now, attendings were also sent this survey, uh, attendings who are in their first few years of practice. And same numbers here, 75% feel only somewhat prepared to manage lacerations. Um, and a lot of those places uh, that they work in uh, APPs, your nurse practitioners and your PAs manage a lot of the lacerations, but that's not going to be the case all the time. And a lot of these do fall back onto the physician to be able to manage. So the next couple slides here are just some examples of patients that I have cared for and managed. A lot of these are included in my course as different case presentations, large uh, laceration to the scalp or to the forehead, uh, lip laceration from a nail, uh, side grinder injury to the hand, uh, tractor versus a foot and this large web space laceration. Uh, unfortunately, the patient was not wearing any uh, steel toe boots. Here's a large scalp laceration that came from uh, the patient striking his head against a tractor. Uh, and this was, this was two years ago. This is the first time that I'd ever managed this, but this was uh, some pretty decent scrotal lacerations that came into my community hospital without urology coverage. Um, and here's a, a slide just with some additional examples. These are all wounds that I have seen and managed myself. I think this middle one here was taken care of by one of the PAs I work with, but you know, large scalp laceration with galia, large skin avulsion. This one was an interesting one where the ear was basically ripped off of the face right here and you've got this damaged and exposed cartilage. So these are the types of things that you are going to be seeing in the community setting. And it's really important for you to gain that confidence and the skill set to be able to manage these. So we've got a little poll question. All these lacks that we just showed, are these things that you would feel comfortable managing by yourself? So if you could, Val's going to put up a, uh, a little poll button uh, and just answer yes or no. Are these things, these, these injuries right here, are these things that you would feel comfortable with repairing yourself? All right, so for today's talk, my goal for you is to come away with four or five tips, regardless if you're an intern, if you're a third or fourth year, or if you're an attending or a faculty uh, that's watching this, come away with a few tips that are going to change how you approach lacerations and hopefully be able to allow you to repair some that you previously did not feel comfortable. We're going to talk about efficiency, intentionality. Uh, and then we're going to go through some basic stuff with, you know, suture materials. We're going to bust a few myths, talk about a, a different technique for a digital block, uh, some must-have products that you need to be familiar with. All right, so we've got about 45 minutes to talk about the clinical stuff. We'll have a little Q&A. Uh, at any point, feel free to put any questions in the chat, and I will try to get to those uh, at the end when we go through this. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the laceration course and just do a quick run through there. All right, case presentations are a great way uh, to be able to discuss and learn about the medical decision-making process involved with lacerations. Just with like with a complex, you know, uh, medically ill patient, uh, there is medical decision-making that's involved with lacerations. And throughout this presentation, I've got a couple slides uh, about this particular uh, case right here, which was an elderly woman who was getting out of her car car door slammed and she ended up with this 10 centimeter laceration to the anterior aspect of the tibia. So what I want you to start thinking about are, you know, what types of other associated injuries could there be? Do I need to get imaging for this? How am I going to irrigate it? What type of anesthetic is going to be involved? How is something like this going to impact the overall flow of my emergency department when I'm sitting there, you know, I'm, I'm going to be tied up for 20 or 30 minutes repairing something like this. Those are the things that should start going through your mind and how you can be efficient 
and manage this all the while everything else is going on around you in your department. So we're going to talk a little bit about the approach, uh, uh, some suture and instrument stuff, and the digital block. This slide right here may be the most important slide that I talk about today. And again, during residency, you know, this is your opportunity to kind of fine tune your skills, develop your approach and how you deal with, uh, you know, complex injuries that come in that are going to take up some time. So as soon as you see that a patient's got a, ba a, a bad lack, uh, perhaps even they're on the tracker board and you see that they've got something, you know, go out and go out to triage, take a look at it. Start thinking about what you're going to need and how you can expedite this patient's care. Once they get back in the room, of course, you go through the ABCs, uh, find out what happened. You know, was there uh, a syncopal episode? Are they on any anti-epileptics? Uh, you know, do they have a history of syncope or atrial fibrillation or any other cardiac things? Of course, talk about their tetanus status. Um, and once you get the wound uncovered and you have a chance to look at it, that should start to give you an idea of what you're going to need. So I see a wound like this. I know what I am going to need. And for me, it's easier to go and get all the supplies myself rather than sit down and type out all the orders, waiting for a nurse. You know, the nurses are busy as we are. And uh, if I have to wait for 15 minutes for somebody else to go and gather all my supplies, I could have already started the repair. So for me, and this may differ with you, but for me, I want to go ahead and get everything that I need so that I know it's all there and I'm not going to have to have any unnecessary trips out of the room to stop in the middle of the procedure because I didn't have the right suture size. Um, you can get the wound anesthetized, uh, leave the room, go chart, see another patient, disposition somebody. Um, and then when it comes to irrigation, you know, if the wound is amenable to it, you can have the patient just stand at the sink and wash the wound out. That buys you some time. Uh, to get caught up on something else and really get a good thorough irrigation of the wound. Uh, and then when you sit down to actually repair it, this is a golden opportunity. You have a captive audience. The patient's not going anywhere. So this is a great opportunity to sit down, talk about your what, what you're doing, the repair itself, and the things for them to look for. You can basically go through your discharge instructions with the patient um, all to, you know, to, to be able to answer any questions that they might have but also to prevent any unnecessary trips back into the room later to answer those questions. If it's super busy and you've got a complex repair that you're doing, you may have to stop in the middle of that repair and go check on things. Make sure that the, 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 the walls aren't caving in on the department, put out any fires, make any phone calls and things like that, and then come back into the room and finish the repair. And that's okay. But what I want you to do is think ahead be mindful of your surroundings and be intentional when you've got a procedure, be it a laceration or an abscess or something else that's going to take your time. Be intentional and be aware of what's going on in your department. All right, so this is a little uh, kind of some basic stuff. Some of you are probably familiar with this. Some of you may not, so I'm just going to break it down. So when we're looking at suture material, we have two classes. We've got absorbable suture and non-absorbable suture. And when you get out into the uh, community setting, you need to be familiar with what you have, what you're able to get, and really try to get, you know, at least obviously one in each class, but preferably to have two different types of suture in each of these classes. I like to have Vicryl for deeper repairs. It's a stronger suture material. Um, and then something like a fast absorbing plain gut or monocryl, which can be used for intraoral or facial lacerations. Uh, and then on your non-absorbable, you want to have at least one. Yeah, I think most people probably use proline, but having ethylon is also good. Uh, sometimes it just comes down to the location of the suture and the uh, ethylon is a black colored suture, which makes it really difficult to see if you're repairing an area that has a lot of facial hair. Uh, so the proline is a blue colored suture. So it's good to have uh, some different options to choose from. Uh, the needle anatomy, you know, this is something that you may get pimped on in your general surgery or trauma surgery uh, rotations, probably more so in med school, uh, but just a little basic anatomy here. So you've got the eye or the swage. That's where the thread comes in. This is the needle length. So whenever you look at a pack of suture and it's got the length, that's what that is referring to. Uh, but the big thing I want to bring to your attention here is the difference between a conventional cutting and a reverse cutting needle. Um, you know, we hear those terms thrown around, but just to really point out exactly what that is. 
So what it's referring to is the cutting edge, the apex of that needle and its location. The conventional cutting is on the concave surface on the inside of the curve of the needle, whereas a reverse cutting needle, that apex or the cutting surface is on the outside. So why that makes a difference is the when we look at the uh, tissue defects that are made by that needle, the reverse cutting, that apex is on the outside. So if you're working on tissue that's thin, friable, uh, perhaps you're working with like a 6.0 proline or something, if you're using a conventional cutting uh, needle, that tissue defect may lend itself to actually tearing through the tissue here because of the apex being closer to the wound margin. So it's also important to make sure that you're putting your sutures uh, far enough away from the wound edge so that it doesn't tear through. So again, just a brief introduction into some of the terminology with the different needles that are available. Here's just some different terminology uh, that's used to describe suture material. I think the biggest one and the most important is the, uh, the concept of memory. And that's the ability of the, or kind of the intrinsic nature of the suture material to retain its shape. Um, it makes it like a, a 3.0 proline is very difficult to work with. It wants to retain its shape. Uh, also elasticity, Ethylon seems to recoil a little bit and kind of has a little bit of stretch to it, but the memory is the one that can sometimes cause problems for it for us. So I don't know if you can see this here. Uh, it's kind of hard to see, but I've got some uh, proline type suture material that was just taken out of a pack and you can see how it wants to retain its shape. So a little trick for you is to just take the suture material in between your thumb and your finger and pull it out like this. You do that two or three times and it straightens it out and it makes it a lot easier to uh, to manipulate and work with. Another little trick is if you're only putting in two or three sutures into a wound, do you really need two feet of suture material? And the answer is no, you don't. So another thing that can be done to make it just easier to work with is to cut that suture material in half and it makes it just a lot, a lot easier and simpler to uh, to work with. All right, so those are just some little helpful tricks that hopefully will make your life a little bit easier. So back to this case. All right, so I've got this patient. She's got this 10 centimeter lac on the front of her leg. Um, I want to ask all the right questions. Is she on any anticoagulants? Is there, you know, chronic steroid use? Um, any reason for her skin to be uh, thinner or friable? Is there any history of peripheral vascular disease? Things that may contribute to a, a prolonged healing phase. Uh, do I need imaging? And for this one, I didn't. Um, yeah, there was no gross contamination at all whatsoever. Very clean wound. Uh, she was able to bear weight. I wasn't concerned about a fracture, but you have to ask if imaging is going to be needed and order the appropriate studies. For anesthesia, you know, we really have two options in our, in our setting in the emergency department, something like lidocaine, perhaps bupivacaine, uh, but for the most part, we're going to either be using lidocaine alone or with epinephrine. I'm a big fan of using epinephrine whenever it's available. If it's not on national back order, uh, it can be mixed up on its own separately. Uh, but using anesthetics with epinephrine are a great way to uh, be able to prolong the length of anesthesia. But the biggest thing is the fact that it helps with vasoconstriction and it provides a an opportunity for a bloodless field. You know, you start sticking around. Uh, with your needle and your forceps or your debriding tissue, uh, these things can you know, are, are just prone to bleeding and using epinephrine really does help just uh, keep a cleaner field for you to work in. Uh, for irrigation, you know, this wound does not lend itself to, uh, you know, grandma putting her leg in the sink and, and washing it out. So, uh, you know, filling up your basin, the instrument basin with tap water using a large syringe. This is another efficiency thing. Uh, whenever you're irrigating out, if you can use a 50 or 60 ml syringe, that just saves you some time uh, with not having to uh, push and pull this syringe over and over again as compared to like a 20 ml syringe. So irrigate out very, very well. And in terms of supplies, I'm going to have my single use instrument kit. I'm going to have two packs of proline, a couple boats of four by four gauze. And for this one, I'm actually going to have some Steri strips and Benzwin. And uh, you'll see why here shortly. All right, so another one where we're kind of kind of go back to the basics. And the reason that I include this 
is in some of the workshops that I do uh, in the urgent care setting, we've got people who have been doing this for a long time, but just because we've been doing something for a long time doesn't necessarily mean that we're doing it right all the time. So I want to talk briefly about instrument handling and just some important tips. So instruments are an extension of your hand and you need to gain some comfort and familiarity, especially with your non-dominant hand using the uh, tissue forceps, just making sure that you're comfortable with this. And whenever you're holding the needle driver, you're putting your thumb and your ring finger down, but not over that first knuckle, all right? So you don't wanna bury your, your fingers all the way in here. You wanna just kind of rest them in here comfortably and get into the practice of being able to open and close the instruments just with one hand so that you can lock the needle in place and then you can actually remove your fingers and have a little bit higher level of uh, dexterity and control over the end of the knee uh, of the needle driver where the needle is. Whenever you're turning the uh, suture, you want to kind of turn the doorknob and do kind of like a supination and just letting the needle follow its natural course as it goes through the tissue. Also very important to make sure that you're using proper body mechanics, having the patient up at a good height or you sitting down so you're not bending over and causing any problems for your back for the rest of the shift. Um, with your tissue forceps, probably uh, a little bit um, underestimated in the importance, you know, you, being able to use your tissue forceps with your non-dominant hand, um, use that to kind of stabilize the tissue as you're entering with your needle driver and your needle, uh, being able to manipulate the needle around and reposition it onto your needle driver so that you don't get any accidental needle sticks. All right, so knots. This is another thing where I think we sometimes get into a rut and you just start doing something and you may not have had any oversight and have somebody really show you the, the, the correct way in doing this. So what we're trying to do is create a squared knot that is secure and will not unravel. So the first throw is, is two wraps around your needle driver. You're grabbing the tail of the thread and pulling it across. And then any subsequent throw is needle driver down, you take a wrap and then you pull the thread in the opposite direction. So your tail and your thread are kind of interwoven like this so that when you pull it down, it creates a nice squared knot. Um, the image here on the left, this is shown when it's done incorrectly. And I see this all the time in workshops where pe people are just taking the tail and they're pulling it in the same direction every time. And that's just not secure and it's much more prone to unravel as opposed to this on the right hand side where that that thread is going back and forth and it secures down very nicely. Uh, this is just a little video that uh, that we have put together and we'll see if it'll come up here. I'm just going to fast forward a little bit. So proper suture technique. Entering the tissue at 90 degrees utilizing your tissue forceps to stabilize, reposition the needle, two throws around the needle driver for your first part, pull across, and then subsequent throws are just one wrap around the needle driver, grabbing the tail and pulling across. And anywhere from three, four, sometimes five throws, it kind of just depends on your own personal preference, at least three wraps. Uh, all together, and then you're going to pull the suture off to the side and cut the, cut the ends of it. And a lot of people like to have the suture knot pulled over towards the side a little bit. That's what I tend to, uh, to do myself. Um, but if you can see here, whenever you're tying your knots, this is when it's done incorrectly. And you see that, that gap in the space in between, as opposed to this nice secured knot over here on the side. So Really try to drill home this important point with people, regardless of how long you've been doing it. Just whenever you're, you're tying your knots in practice, really try to focus on that, taking the tail on the opposite side each time. All right, so I'm gonna switch gears a little bit to the digital block. Um, we see a lot of finger injuries, uh, and I'm sure if I could get a raise of hands here, you probably have repaired a finger injury within the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, and we do a lot of digital blocks. How I was trained and how I did it up until honestly probably a year and a half ago uh, was to do the technique where you're putting an injection on either side of the finger and you can see the cross-sectional and longitudinal, longitudinal anatomy right here. 
what we're trying to do is get these dorsal and volar digital nerves. So if you put an injection on both sides, you're going to get those. Um, but this new technique that, well, it's not new, it's been around for a long time, but new to me um, was the, it's called a transthecal block and it's a single injection and it works amazingly well. And I encourage you to try this, excuse me, next time uh, you are doing a digital block. The landmarks are very simple. You're looking at the volar palmar crease at the MCP joint. You're going to take your needle, go in about 45 degrees, go down to the bone, withdraw a little bit, aspirate, make sure you're not in a blood vessel. And then you're going to instill three or four mLs of your anesthetic into the finger. And it works very well, especially for injuries where there, there might be multiple lacerations, you know, like from glass or grabbing something sharp, hedge trimmers, chainsaws, whatever. And if you need to anesthetize multiple adjacent fingers, this is a great way to be able to do that. All right, so that's one very helpful tip. I hope I encourage you to, to try that out the next time you've got a digital block to do. All right, so the closure for this case presentation, this 10 centimeter laceration, uh, you know, there are a couple ways that you could repair this. Um, I thought about doing staples, but as, as far apart as the edges were, um, I didn't feel like I would be able to bring them together adequately to employ staples. Uh, the skin is very thin, uh, and I was concerned about the suture material tearing through. So what I did, this is a, kind of, uh, a technique that I had heard about, but I've never had an opportunity to use it. So essentially what you're trying to do is bolster the skin by using strips. So after the wound's been anesthetized, it's been irrigated, um, I just put some benzoin glue along the margin of the wound, and then I applied strips all along it. And then I was able to place a number of horizontal mattress sutures, which really give a lot more strength to a wound, and they're also faster. So just uh, utilized a, a series of horizontal mattress sutures all the way across, and I think there was a single interrupted here at the end, and it came together beautifully. This was a fantastic repair um, and was really happy with, with uh, the outcome. Spoke to the orthopedic surgeon for follow-up. He had never seen this technique either, so it was an opportunity for both of us to, uh, to learn something a little bit new. But this came together very well and, again, is another little trick that you can have up your sleeve. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about some bad practice habits and some myths. All right, a sterile field. We're not putting in a central line. It's a dirty wound to start with, and the use of sterile technique, it's, it's really not applicable for this. Uh, we're not in the OR with virgin tissue that's, you know, and, and, and trying to, to do everything sterile. You want to clean as best you can. You can use the little sterile drapes to keep your supplies in, try to keep the patient's hair and their face, your hands away from everything. But we, we're really not trying to get a sterile field here. It's a dirty wound. Sterile water, kind of the same thing. There are ample studies showing that sterile water is not essential. Uh, tap water is just as safe when it comes to infections associated with laceration repair. Um, if you have a preference and you want to use sterile water, sure, that's totally fine. But there, there's a small cost savings. And if it's not in the room, you may have to go you know, searching around for it. So tap water is completely safe for you to be able to use. Another one is sterile gloves. Um, ample studies showing that sterile gloves are not necessary for laceration repair. Uh, the clean gloves that you find in the box are safe, they're effective, and there's no difference in infection rates. Uh, now, this one does have a, a pretty significant cost savings associated with it. A pair of sterile gloves may be in the range of two to you know two dollars to two dollars and fifty cents versus next to nothing for the clean gloves that are in a box. Now, if you have a strong preference because of the fit and the feel, by all means, feel free to continue to use the sterile gloves, but just know that they're not essential. Um, here's another one. We don't actually have a poll question for this, but heck, feel free to, uh, to, to throw your, your response here in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, we've all heard that mantra of the fingers, nose, penis, and toes. Uh, well, it's it's not right. It's not correct. It's been debunked and plastic surgeons and uh, orthopedic surgeons routinely use uh, epinephrine containing compounds in hand and finger surgery. Um, it provides a longer action of duration. And the biggest thing is that it helps with the control of bleeding. 
Um, it is safe, it's effective, and um, I use epinephrine and lidocaine all the time for digital blocks and sometimes just even soaking the finger if you've got like a little tissue avulsion or something like that. So epinephrine is safe to use uh, for finger injuries. All right, another one that we sometimes see is you'll walk into a room um, and a patient's hand will be soaking in a tub of betadine. Well, it's just not necessary. And studies looking at this show no difference in infection rates with cleansing and cleaning with betadine or chlorhexidine compared to water alone. So if you're looking at it from an academic standpoint, if there's no improvement in the infection rate, which is the thing you're trying to prevent compared to water alone, then, then why use it? Um, I've noticed that some of our um, you know, orthopedic colleagues, they will, they will continue to use, and that's fine. There, there's no harm in doing so, but it's not essential. So chlorhexidine, same thing. Um, hydrogen peroxide, never. There's no role in hydrogen peroxide in the acute setting for wound cleansing, irrigation, or anything whatsoever. It's tissue cidal, and it can just cause problems. Um, my, in my practice, I tend to just use water for pretty much everything, using water to dry or to loosen any dry blood. Um, you know, after it's anesthetized, soaking, uh, you know, taking a few gauze and just putting it over the wound to kind of loosen the, uh, the dried blood and then cleaning it off uh, prior to the repair. All right, so irrigation, this is one that I've spent a lot of time on uh, personally, um, and there's a lot of bad practice habits. Um, the goal of irrigation, is, you know, the solution to pollution is dilution. So what we're trying to do is irrigate, irrigate, irrigate to lessen the bacterial load and utilizing pressure to overcome the adhesive forces of bacteria and biofilm. So there's two things. You need to have the volume, which is 50 to 100 cc's per centimeter of laceration. So the math is pretty easy. And then what you're trying to do is generate 12 to 15 PSI. You cannot generate that pressure by taking an, a, a bottle of saline and poking some holes in it and squeezing it. One, it doesn't generate the pressure. And then two, it's very tiresome. If you're sitting here squeezing a bottle over and over again, by the time you get to the repair, your hands are going to be shaking. So the best thing that you can do is either at the tap or, again, using a syringe with a splash guard. That does provide the required pressure to, uh, to effectively irrigate the wound. All right, back to the case. So with this large pretibial laceration, I'm not going to sit here and read this all out. You can read that you know, for yourselves. But when it comes to community practice and your reimbursement dependent, upon the documentation that you put in. And we hear this all the time from, uh, from customers that we work with. People will just say leg laceration stapled, and that's it. That's the extent of their documentation. So when it comes to documentation for you know, the billing and coding aspect of it, there's three things that are required. You have to have the location, the length, and the complexity. And the level of complexity increases with things such as uh, debridement of devitalized tissue placement of deep sutures, uh, gross contamination that required significant time and removal of uh, you know, foreign bodies with tissue forceps. So all of those things are very important for you to include in your documentation. All right, so we're gonna switch over to some must-have products. Now I'm not advocating everybody go out and, and have your department buy these things, but just things for you to be familiar with and have uh, as emergency medicine residents you probably all have a pair of trauma shears. They're great. They're, uh, it's kind of like a stethoscope. You just got to have them, uh, you know, for cutting off clothes, cutting off bandages that people come in with, uh, cutting uh, splint material, et cetera. Another one is lighting. And not every room that we work in has a nice, fancy OR light. And in order to be able to do procedures, you have to be able to see what you're doing. So I would encourage you to get, and you can get them on Amazon. There's a hundred different options that are available. A good, high quality, super bright, rechargeable LED light. You can bring it with you in your work bag. Uh, you may just keep it over at your workstation and you know several of you can share it, whatever you want to do, but have something uh, that allows you a good light source so that you can see what you're doing. Now I mentioned a ruler and partly because of what we had in the previous slide with the documentation. Uh, you may not want to walk around with a hard plastic ruler um, or a tape measure, but in every 
cabinet, probably in every room in your uh, department, you've got these cotton tip applicators, also boxes of four by four gauze. They have a small ruler on there. So these are important when you uh, are measuring a laceration. You can just pull one of these out and use that as a measuring tool uh, for documentation to let them know, uh, you know how long the laceration was. Also for you know things like cellulitis, uh, you know other things that just need to be measured. These things are everywhere, and just be aware of that uh, little ruler being on the cotton tip applicator. Cyanoacrylate, aka dermabond or glue, um, being advocated for more and more for a lot of repairs. So whenever you have an opportunity to repair a wound with dermabond, just make sure that you have that experience and that practice uh, so that you feel comfortable with it. Staplers are another big thing, and not all staplers are created equal. Um, I'm a big fan of the surgical stapler. I used to have one sitting around here with me. Um, using a good quality surgical stapler as opposed to the little finger held ones, um, I find those to be very wobbly um, and oftentimes have to remove some of the staples because they just don't, um, they don't have the same uh, degree of purchase whenever you're putting them in. So really advocate for the higher quality staplers if you're able to do so. Stereo strips and Benzwin, like I talked about earlier with that one particular repair, uh, but they're great for skin tears and things like that. So again, while you're in training, really try to utilize as many different uh, wound closure techniques as you can. And stereo strips are, are, are one of those. And then lastly, uh, finger tourniquet. And I think I'll talk about that here in a second. Yes, next slide, actually. All right, finger tourniquets. Um, it never fails that whenever I'm repairing a laceration on the finger, and I don't put a finger tourniquet on, the thing bleeds like a stuck pig, and it's just, it's a mess. So I really try to get in the practice of grabbing a finger tourniquet for every finger laceration, and I encourage you all to do the same thing. And there's a handful of different ways to do this. There's some commercially available ones, but you can do a makeshift one with a glove, and you just put it on the patient's hand. Let's say it's the index finger. You can just snip the tip of it off and basically roll it down to the base of the finger, and that serves as a tourniquet. This is important for several things. One, you wanna have a bloodless field. You wanna be able to explore the wound, make sure there's no foreign bodies, and also make sure that there's no deeper tissue involvement, no deeper structures like uh, tendons, joint capsules, and things like that. So using a finger tourniquet is very important. There's two caveats here. One, if you put it on, you have to take it off. It is your responsibility, not the nurses, not the techs, not somebody else your responsibility. There's tons of cases of finger tourniquets being left on, which have resulted in uh, digital necrosis and fingers being amputated. The second thing is it's the Goldilocks principle. You want to apply, you know, the, the goal for this is to just overcome the arterial pressure, the arteriolar pressure, so that it doesn't bleed. You don't want to exert so much pressure that it ends up causing nerve damage. So just make sure that if you are using a tourniquet, you're not applying so much pressure that you cause injury. All right, so this is some follow-up uh, for that patient. This is at two weeks, this is at four weeks, and this is at six months. And you can see that this wound came together very nicely and it healed very well. And I think what we were able to do with this is prevent a prolonged, complicated course, perhaps even wound clinic, uh, you know, patient having to go to the wound clinic or something like that. So um, that, that's another important point. With lacerations that you repair, try to get follow-up on them. They may not always come back on your shift for suture removal. So if the patient's agreeable to it, you know, get their phone number, follow up with them and see how the, the repair ended up coming out. All right, so we're gonna switch gears to some advanced techniques here. Um, with a bleeding varicose vein, this is not an uncommon thing. I've seen quite a few who have been referred from their primary care doc or an urgent care because they've got a bleeding varicose vein. The figure of eight stitch has a lot of utility and it gets its name from the fact that it looks like the number eight tipped over on its side. So you see right here, you got a figure of eight. And what this is, is basically two interrupted sutures next to each other and you just don't cut the thread in between and you tie it off in the middle. So this is great for bleeding varicose veins. It's also good for patients who may have uh, bleeding from an arterial puncture after a heart catheterization. And another one um, that I've, I've done this quite a few times is after a patient has had uh, paracentesis and they've just got oozing of ascites from that puncture site, this is an easy, quick fix to just tie that off, 
you can use absorbable suture and it'll it'll come out on its own over the course of the next uh, week or two. All right, we already talked about the stereo strips, combining those with suture. You can also combine those with glue and the orientation of your stereo strips can either be uh, in parallel or perpendicular to the wound. Uh, we've already talked about this one that was included in the case presentation. Um, these are the fun ones. Now we get into some more advanced techniques and things that you are going to see if you have not already seen. Some points here are to develop a strategy before you get started. Just like pilots have a checklist, they know what to do in case they you know, encounter any complications. There's nothing wrong with taking a picture of the wound and going down to your desk and think about it, draw it out. How do you think that this wound is gonna to come together and develop that approach before you grab the suture with your needle driver and start going. It may help you prevent uh, some mishaps um, and, and really just kind of put your mind in the right space so that you can go through this and you know perhaps anticipate any problems that may come up. You may have to adjust your approach and that's okay, but I encourage you to at least try this out and see if it helps. The more tricks that you have with some of these different techniques, the more you can do. All right, so parallel lacerations. These are wounds, you know, they may be self-inflicted, self-harm, um, but sometimes wounds just are not nice and clean. And you've got these little tissue bridges and tissue islands in between them that can be a little bit tricky. We don't want to start loading these little, uh, you know, intervening uh, islands of tissue up with suture because it may strangulate it and it may damage it. So a technique that you can use here is basically just an extended horizontal mattress suture. So I'm going to put my suture here on the proximal end, and then I'm going to use my tissue forceps, again with my non-dominant hand, to stabilize the skin and basically thread the needle and thread through the dermal layer of these little tissue islands. And then I'm going to come out distally, go across, and then do the same thing in the reverse direction and tie it off up here. You can do this, you know, multiple times in a row. You can repeat that same process over and over again and once you put this in, it really just brings the tissue together uh, and avoid the uh, excess needle sticks and tissue strangulation if you were to uh, put a bunch of sutures into those individual tissue islands. Here's an example. This is that tractor to the foot. Uh, the proximal aspect of this wound was just kind of this macerated tissue that was, you know, looked a little uh, discolored. So I just took my suture and thread uh, needle and thread all the way through here, came across and then did the same thing in reverse and tied it off up there. Here's another example. This was an eyebrow laceration. You know, you just see this little tissue bridge that's coming through here. So what I was able to do is just put an extended horizontal mattress up to here and then came back out. And that brought that more complex area together very nicely. Now we've got corner, V, Y shape, stellate, all these things that we see, uh, and how do you bring these together? Well, kind of like with the previous slide, these are just modified horizontal mattress stitches. For the corner flap, entering the dermis, coming out, or the epidermis, coming out the dermis, using my tissue forceps to kind of stabilize this, and I'm just gonna loop my needle through the dermal layer of this floppy end uh, of this uh, V-shaped laceration here, I'm going to come out the uh, dermal layer through the epidermis and tie it off. And what happens is it just allows that tissue to be brought into close proximity without strangulating it. You know, you can put a single suture from here to here, but it may tear through. This tissue may not be that clean, and it's uh, this is just a great way to be able to bring that in by taking a little bit larger bite of that tissue. The same thing applies for a Y-shaped or a stellate X or cross-shaped laceration, same type of thing. You're basically just threading the needle and thread through the dermal layer of these little floppy ends here and bringing them together on the, si on the same side that you started on. I use these probably on a weekly basis, and it's a great technique. You can try with a practice suture pad, uh, but you know, definitely try them out on patients and see how they go. Another important point is, if you put it in and it doesn't come together like you want it to, cut it out and start over again. There's no harm in removing a suture and starting over. 
All right. So the discussion for this one, and that's kind of the, the, the whole approach that I take with all of these is basically five different slides per case and going through all of these different things. So for this one in particular, there wasn't a need for imaging. I wanted to use a big, thick suture with a large needle. Um, biggest concerns for something like this would be, you know, was the patient on any anticoagulants? Was there a concern for foreign bodies? There wasn't. I didn't need any imaging. Uh, the fact that it was an elderly patient, lower extremity injuries are more prone to infection. And the fact that there was a, a, a pretty large amount of soft tissue injury, this is a patient that I did opt to provide antibiotics for. Uh, this is another one where I make the phone call myself and I arrange close follow-up for this patient. Uh, it's also recommended for this type of wound to provide a knee immobilizer and crutches just because this type of wound does have a high rate of dehiscence and you want to try to be able to reduce some of that tension by providing the crutches and the knee immobilizer. So all in all, this one went very well. There are some of the case presentations that I include where it didn't go well, and we talk about that as well. All right, so that kind of wraps up the clinical part of this. Um, you know, we've all heard the, uh, the phrase, the proverbial tip of the iceberg. Well, this webinar was kind of the tip of the iceberg. Um, I usually don't talk this fast, but there's a lot of information that I wanted to get through. Uh, but everything that we need to know about lacerations really is under the surface. Um, there's a lot more out there. I can tell you that I have learned more about lacerations over the past two years doing this and putting it together, which shows me that I've still got a lot to learn. And as residents, you do as well. And that's OK. Uh, that's why we are in a career in a field where, you know, lifelong learning is uh, is part of it. So um, I hope that you enjoyed the um this aspect of it. And it looks like I did have another, was there another poll question? Yeah. So we do have another uh, poll question. Yes. On the next slide, actually. So as a resident, would this type of content be helpful to you? And if you could just answer the poll question, it's a yes or no. If you got any additional comments, please share them. But do you think that this type of content as a resident would be helpful? All right. So now we're going to open it up to questions and answers. So if you've got any questions here, please drop them in the chat and please don't be shy. Feel free to ask any questions about any of the, the myths, bad practice habits, anything in here that you think would be useful or anything that you're curious about. One of the things, and a lot of the, the webinars that um, that I give, one of the things that always comes up is, you know, with the epinephrine in the fingers. Um, and interestingly, where that came to be was somewhere back in the 1900s, there was a series of patients that had this digital necrosis that was associated with uh, injections in the, of anesthetic with epinephrine uh, in the fingers. So I think that that's where that myth came from. But what they found out when they went back and actually looked at things was that the preservative that was used in the anesthetic degraded the um, uh, the solution and it dropped the pH down almost to a level of one. So what happened is that they were actually injecting pure acid into the fingers. And that's where the digital necrosis came from. Um, you know, some people have actually taken care of patients or they know somebody who has that's had, you know, something with the epinephrine. Um, but by and large, it is safe. And that myth has, has largely been dispelled. So let's see. Well, it doesn't look like there are any questions yet. So I will keep moving along then. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the laceration course, what is included, what it comes with. Uh, so again, very comprehensive course. You can see all the different modules here. There are 13 modules. Uh, what I try to include are the things that we're supposed to know, but we never get taught. Uh, there's a lot of the basic sciences and things like that, but we also, uh, is epinephrine safe for ring blocks? Yes, it is. Um, we talk about the disposition, uh, documentation, the notes. There's a dedicated lecture on billing and coding so that you know what to put in your chart so that you can get properly reimbursed. Uh, there is an 80-minute discussion with an attorney who is also an emergency physician. Uh, his name is Bill Sullivan, and we talk about the things that can get you in trouble from a medico-legal perspective. 
the things that you have to include in your notes, uh, the importance of good interpersonal skills, uh, you know, answering questions appropriately, making sure that you have good discharge instructions, what happens when you have bounce backs and things like that. Uh, we cover a lot of uh, finger and facial wounds. We talk about facial nerve blocks. Um, so it's really a comprehensive course. There's a couple of uh, full length laceration repairs that I have done, uh, a total of 12 case presentations that go through this medical decision making process. So really a lot there. And I think that you would benefit from uh, from taking a closer look. Uh, also, that comes with the suture pad. If you are purchasing as an individual, you do get this free practice suture pad. I designed this myself with some complex lacs so that you can practice the um, uh, that extended horizontal mattress. And we've also got a set of three dimensional lips that's including uh, that's included uh, so that you can get some experience with uh, suturing on a contoured surface and some vermilion repair uh, vermilion border repairs. So that also comes with the course. We've got a QR code menu. Um, of selected videos that you can just take your smartphone, go directly to the video to, uh, to, uh, to walk you through some different techniques. Um, you also get a cheat sheet. Uh, this would be emailed to you. You can print it off and it's just got some high yield stuff. Uh, you know, when to use what type of suture, how long sutures and staples need to stay in, uh, some billing and coding basics and things like that. All right, so for residency programs, we also offer um, an opportunity to be able to get the uh, laceration course for your entire program. Um, it comes at a discounted rate. Everybody gets access. Uh, we're able to provide progress reports so that your program director uh, can see how much of the course everybody has gone through. It's easy to integrate into the curriculum. Um, and it can also be available for rotating medical students. It's kind of a nice perk. Students rotating with your program, you provide them with access to the laceration course. And it just, it's kind of a nice thing for students to be able to have. And it provides a lot of opportunity for discussion and for some hands on teaching uh, while the students are rotating through your department. And we do offer a discounted faculty rate uh, for groups that purchase the course. And another thing is, um, you know, before the new interns get started every year on July 1st, it's something that they can go through. Uh, so that they can hit the ground running on July 1st. All right, so this is just a little study that was uh, released, I guess it was in 2015, showing the effectiveness. This was for medical students, it wasn't residents, but for medical students, uh, comparing video-based training for laceration repair to the traditional workshop method, and the outcomes were very similar. So it is a very effective way to be able to introduce and integrate this type of teaching uh, for this content uh, into your program's curriculum. And I can assure you, um, if you go through the laceration course, you are going to have a much deeper knowledge base. Uh, your technical skill, if you put the time, effort, and energy into using your suture pad and employing these techniques on real patients that you see, your technical skill is going to skyrocket. Lastly, and probably most importantly, is your confidence. Um, there's nothing that's more uncomfortable than doing a procedure that you, you, know, you haven't done before, you don't feel comfortable with. And that's my goal with this, is to give you as a resident the skill set and the confidence to be able to manage these things so that when you get out into the real world, you will be much better prepared. And I think that going through this will, will, will definitely give you that. So I'm going to give a quick demo of the website real quick. Let's see here. Here's something screen. And let's see here. All right. Just a quick demo for uh, the laceration course here. This is what it looks like uh, when you go into EB Medicine's website, you have your product library, uh, choose whichever topics you've got. And then the laceration course, all the modules show up here. And uh, whenever you complete one, it, it gets marked as complete. And a couple of, well, let's see here, I'm gonna log in. I apologize, thought I was logged in. All right. All right, so we're going to look at the laceration course. 
So again, all the different modules that you've got, I'm going to hone in on this one, the face and finger injuries. Um, you can download the audio to your phone. You can listen to it on the go. You can also download all of the lecture slides. Uh, but another thing that, um, that I included with this is each lecture has a set of hyperlinks that are referenced throughout the course. So if you want to go and learn a little bit more about something, um, you can click on the hyperlink and it'll take you to uh, some external resources for you to dig a little bit deeper, uh, perhaps print off and share with your colleagues, things like that. So that's a brief run through of the um, website part of it. And let me see if I can get back into. Yeah, here we go. All right. So that's the demo of the website. EB Medicine, just a few words about EB Medicine. Again, they've been in the emergency medicine space for a long time. Uh, emergency medicine practice, pediatric emergency medicine practice, and now into urgent care with evidence-based urgent care, uh, the laceration course. And there's also a five-hour EKG course uh, that may be of interest to you as well. Uh, for residents and students, if you're not already aware of and familiar with this, uh, EB Medicine kindly offers uh, their online version of um, emergency medicine practice and pediatric emergency medicine practice for free for residents. I encourage you, if you've not already done so, to take advantage of this resource. You can follow the link here. Uh, we'll also send this out to you by email uh, where you can just click on this link here, ebmedicine.net slash residents, and it walks you through the steps so that you can get access to uh, those very valuable emergency medicine resources. Uh, there's also a free podcast called Amplify, and this accompanies each issue of emergency medicine practice. Um, I listen to this regularly. When I was studying for boards a few years ago, I probably went through 20 of the Amplify podcasts uh, to listen to those, and they are fantastic. It's really a great resource to uh, uh to, to hammer some of the points home that are included in each issue. So for all of you uh, with AAEMRSA, if you're interested in the laceration course, we're offering 10% off of the already reduced price for students and residents. Uh, it's uh, normally $99 for students and residents. Take another 10% off and it drops it down to $89. Uh, if there's any attendings and faculty who are interested, you can use this code, the AAEMRSA-TLC, and that do drops 10% uh, off of the retail course that does come with 10 CME credits. Um, anybody who purchases does get the free practice suture kit mailed directly to you. And we're wrapping up here. The last thing that I'm going to mention, although the name of it is Urgent Care Clinicians, this is a Facebook group that we've created. Uh, and any of you are more than welcome to come in and join. If you're on Facebook, feel free to, uh, to come in and join that group. Uh, really just trying to create a, a, a community where people can come in, ask questions, uh, share cool clinical cases that you've got. Uh, we regularly put up uh, free content from EB Medicine into that group. And again, really just trying to stimulate some conversation and giving people an opportunity to come in and share what they are, uh, they, may, they may have questions about. So keep an eye out for an email from EB Medicine. You'll have a replay link for this webinar please share it with your program director and your uh, residency classmates. Um, we'll have the discount code information and our contact information. If there's anything that I can do for you, please don't hesitate to reach out. Here's my email address. Um, we're on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube under the laceration course. And if any of you ever have any interest in doing any laceration specific research, please reach out to me. I'd love to, uh, to be involved, help you in any way that I possibly can. And I think that is it. So if there are any other questions, please drop them in the chat. And I want to thank you uh, for joining, uh, taking time out of your day. Also, thanks to EB Medicine and AAEMRSA for uh, helping us put this together and share the word. Any questions from anybody? All right. Well, I think we'll wrap it up there right on time, 3.59. Perfect timing. So again, thank you all for showing up and let us know if there's any questions. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out.
Yeah. So the figure of eight. Okay. Um, figure of eight is it's just uh, it's a suture technique where you're putting two interrupted sutures next to each other. And let me see if I can find it here. And I'll uh, and just to let you know, I'm fine sticking around, answering any questions, and talking. So the figure of eight, you're entering your the the tissue right here. You can see my cursor, and then you come out across here. So instead of just stopping and tying this off as an interrupted suture, I'm just taking my needle and thread and coming up on the same side where I started, entering here or exiting here, and then tying it off in the middle. As opposed to, I mean, it's kind of similar to a horizontal mattress stitch where I enter here, exit here, enter here and exit here and tie it off on this side. I'm essentially just doing two interrupted sutures, not cutting it in the middle and just tying it off right there. So it's time saving. You're not having to tie two knots. You're only tying one knot. And it's a quick way to be able to introduce some pressure and the tamponade effect that we're trying to get whenever we're trying to control a little bleeder um, or that oozing from the paracentesis. So again, just the, uh, you know, it's kind of a modified horizontal mattress stitch, uh, inner, inner exit, inner exit, and tie it off in the middle. And Noman, I hope I hope that explains that a little bit better for you. And again, any questions, don't hesitate to reach out, join the Facebook group. And if you think that this, this would be of any benefit to your residency program, we'd love to work with you. Please pass it along to your program director and uh, or connect us by email. And we'd love to work with you. Yes, you will get the slides, as uh, uh, Valerie just said here. You'll get a copy of the slides and the recorded video so that you can watch it over again. All right, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for your time.